Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Improving Journalistic Writing, How Students Can Tell Better Stories, with our guest, Vince Felak. My name is Michael Todd. I'm the Social Science Communication Manager at Sage Publishing and a former newspaper editor. Now, let me begin by introducing you to Vince. Uh, Vincent Pilak is a professor of journalism at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, where he primarily teaches courses on media writing and reporting. Prior to his arrival at UWO, he served on the faculty at Ball State University and also taught courses at the University of Missouri and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Before becoming an academic, Vince worked for the Wisconsin State Journal and for the Columbia Missourian newspapers. The College Media Association awarded Vince its Distinguished Four-Year Newspaper Advisor Award for his work with the Advanced Titan, the student newspaper at Oshkosh, while the National Scholastic Press Association presented him with its highest honor, the Pioneer Award, award quote, in recognition of significant contributions to high school publications and journalism programs, end quote. As a scholar, he's received more than a dozen top conference paper awards, including those from the Association for Education and Journalism and Mass Communication, the Broadcast Education Association, and the International Public Relations Society of America. He is also the 2008 winner of the College Media Association's Norton Research Award, which goes to the best research paper completed on a topic pertaining to media advisors within a given year. Now, Vince has written a number of books for SAGE including Dynamics of Writing, Dynamics of Media Writing, and Dynamics of News Reporting and Writing. Next year, we'll see his Dynamics of Media Editing debut. And if you like Vince's style, I recommend checking out his Dynamics of Writing blog at dynamicsofwriting, that's all one word, dot com. Now, this one-hour webinar will be recorded and archived for view future viewing, and we'll be sending out a link to view it and to access the slides to all registrants in the coming weeks. Now, if you have any problems with audio or viewing mode during the webinar, please use the Q&A box at the right of your screen and one of our helpful team members will get back to you ASAP. At the end of the webinar, we will have time for a Q&A from attendees, so please also use that Q&A box to ask any questions of speakers throughout the webinar. And just to be clear, you can ask them while he, Vince is speaking, but we won't get to them until he's done with his presentation. And please also take note of the webinar hashtag, hashtag SageTalks, and feel free to ask questions or to leave comments there. We will be monitoring it. Now, without further ado, I'll pass it over to Vince. Great. Well, thank you, Michael. I appreciate that. And uh, I appreciate everybody here taking the time on a Friday to come in and take a look at what I have to say about why students tend to fail at writing. But before I get started on that, I do want to say that uh, anybody who asks a question, even if we don't get to it in the webinar, I'll be happy to cover it uh, via email or with a text or even offline at some point. I grew up in a very old Polish Catholic family where we believe that if you have a, a group of people over, you want to make sure that they're well taken care of. So the family philosophy always was if you leave our party hungry or sober, well, that's your choice. In any case, uh, I'll get to everything you have to ask and more. I'm sorry, say that again? Could, hey, could you accept your screen invite? I did indeed. It should be up. Okay. Let's see here. Hmm. I don't know why I accepted it. It was there. Can we see it now? It was there and then gone. That's peculiar. Is it still here? Michael's trying again. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. This actually worked once, and the minute I had to touch it, we're in a lot of trouble. Well. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm wonder, uh, Lydia, I'm wondering if you might move the, the slides for Vince. Vince, what we're, need, we're going to need you to just let us know when you want to switch from slide to slide. Right. Okay. Let's see what we got here. So you guys can't see me? You guys can't see the screen? 
application. There we go. We're good to go. So, family members, let's uh, let's make sure we're we're full and full and not sober by the end of this. Vince, we're good to go. Not he not hearing Vince. Folks, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, we're back now. Uh, shall we try this again and see what happens? Or uh, let's see what we can do here. Okay. Can you see my screen or not? Or are you guys going to handle the slides? Okay, well, I think we'll let you guys take care of the slides here. So. Why don't we just begin with uh, what I've got here, which is the three key reasons that students fail at writing. Um, most of the time, students have trouble because they've always been good at writing. Uh, this is something that they've been doing ever since third grade when they had to do that report on the iguana. And everybody who was a teacher told them, oh, you're so wonderful at this. Well, the minute that they get into one of our media writing classes or our news writing classes, they have some serious difficulty there because suddenly it's just not what they're used to. Um, when I try to explain things to students, a lot of them kind of find their way into the answer by what they lovingly refer to as the Philokism of the day. Um, I've done everything from compare verbs to engines in a car all the way on through to the kinds of items that you see here. So you're going to get the three Philokisms on uh, the reasons why students fail at writing. You can see them on the screen here, I hope, uh, which is what I call the Big Mac approach to sentence writing. That looks appetizing and delicious. Uh, the fairy tale approach to storytelling, and then the I drool, I rule writing paradox. Now, why don't we consider each one of these in turn, and we can go to the next slide here. Um, the Big Mac approach to sentence writing, uh, I, I, I talk about it this way because Students tend to build their sentences the way that we build a Big Mac, which is to say there's not a whole heck of a lot of meat in there. And because of that, you find yourself uh, having to slather on special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions, and that sesame seed bun. And as those of you who are a little older might remember the great commercial from Wendy's, uh, Clara Peller screaming, where's the beef? Um, students tend to build their sentences from back to front or from top to bottom. In other words, they don't tend to build them from the core on out. And when they end up having the opportunity to build a sentence, in most cases, they don't really have good meat. They don't have that thing on the inside that says, you know, this is really where all the value is. Instead, what they do is what I occasionally call the B-plus answer. They just keep throwing words into this thing until eventually it looks like the screen is full and they figure ah, the answer is in there somewhere. It's probably worth a B plus. Now, as educators, there's a, a pretty simple way to fix some of this. Is to, and it goes back to what a lot of us were taught many, many years ago, especially if, if those of you like I uh, spent any time with ancient nuns. Um, if you want to flip to the next slide you can see the idea of trying to work your way on through from the core on out. So you start with what I, I lovingly call the Holy Trinity, the noun verb and the object of the sentence. And when I have to teach uh, writing for the media, which covers all forms of media writing, which is PR, ad, news, digital, social media, whatever, and when I have to teach reporting, uh, which is mostly for the news students, I like to focus them on this, this holy trinity. And if you start with that as the core, you really have this very strong focus. And if you can get them to understand how to use a concrete noun and a really vigorous verb, they should be able to tell you almost anything in terms of what they want to say in the sentence. And when they realize they only have two or three words to make that sentence work, they're going to focus better. So instead of trying to create some sort of hyperbole, they just have to knock it down very simply. So things like 
the Brewers beat the Cubs, or Bill hit Bob, or the mayor robs the bank, you get that sense of, of how to start with a very simple idea. And this is something that's going to come back into play even more so when we get into uh, the remainder of this. So if you want to click to the next slide, um, the other way that you start helping them fix this problem is you start with that core and instead of building front to back, you make them add layers based on value. Uh, when I lived in Indiana, there was a guy who was famous for having the world's largest ball of paint. Uh, the Guinness Book of World's Records came out there and verified it on the guy. And they asked him how he did it. He literally said, I dropped a baseball in a can of paint, and then I painted it again, and I painted it again. And, you know, 30 some years later, I've got this giant ball of paint. And it's that same kind of approach here, which is to say, you just keep adding layers to the outside in terms of value. So I picked one of my favorite examples here uh, simply because I'm a Cavs fan, but Cavaliers won championship, noun, verb, object. So what's the next layer that you want to add? Well, you can add some of the impact, some of the value. It was the first title that the uh, city of Cleveland had received in more than 52 years. Then you add on the outside layer, another one, you know, how did they come back? Who did they beat? And then you kind of move on from there. The idea is that you want to just keep adding layers instead of just starting at the front and weaving through the back. If you want to flip to the next slide, you can see uh, the last way to fix this problem. Uh, for those of you who are parents or grandparents and have spent any time with uh, a four-year-old, you'll understand that a four-year-old's favorite question is why. Well, it should also be a journalist's favorite question, and it's also something that I tend to push when I'm trying to teach the students how to write their sentences. It started with my old boss, George Kennedy, uh, who used to ask our reporters, you know, to what degree their uh, stories would add to the sum of human knowledge. George was a little sarcastic on occasion, and on more than one, one or two reporters, he would tell them that not only did they not add something to the sum of human knowledge, they actually managed to subtract something from it. Well, one of the better ways to figure out if we were adding value to something, whether it was a story or a sentence or, or anything else, was to ask why when it came to what we decided to add or to leave out of a sentence. So when I'm editing over the shoulders of students in my uh, writing for the media class, what I tend to do is I tend to kind of look over their shoulder and say, why did you put this in the in the front of the lead, or why did you put this in the second paragraph, or why did you include this in part of the story? And they've been taught to this point that being questioned means they're doing something wrong. So they immediately say, I'm sorry, I'll fix it. Well, no, when you were four years old, you always wanted to know why, 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 and you really wanted to know. And at that point, that's what I want. I really want to know. So I ask them, why did you do this? And if they could say, well, I did it for X, Y, and Z reason, a lot of times what would happen is they'd see some value in it, and so would I. If they said, well, I don't know, then we probably had to cut it out and, and work on it and kind of go from there. What I always tell my students and what I, I try to preach and, and try to practice what I preach is that I want my students to question what they've done and why they did it before they just say, well, I guess it's good enough. Now, you can go to the next slide. Um, we've got the, uh, the, the second kind of problem, which is what I call the fairy tale approach to storytelling. When students learn how to engage a story, a lot of times it starts when they're a little kid and they, they deal with fairy tales. And every fairy tale starts off with, you know, once upon a time, and then kind of walks all the way on through. And at the end, it's, and they all lived happily ever after. So everything they ever wrote moves from that concept of the beginning to the end in this very temporal fashion. And if you think about it, everything they've written to this point has pretty much been that way too. And as a consumer, everything they consume is chronological. Uh, whether it's a reality TV show or one of those young adult novels, I mean, I, I, I can't imagine that, you know, the kids try on The Bachelor for the season opener, and they say, oh, uh, Bethany's going to win The Bachelor's Heart. She's winning it this this year. Now let's go back and see how that happened. You know, you got to wait all the way on through till May for all the twists and turns to get done to figure out who's going to be the, the Bachelor or the Bachelorette or whatever else is going on in there. So 
they've had that issue. But the other thing that they've had a problem with is education to this point. And if you ever tell a student, I need you to write a paper for me, or I need you to write an article for me, I am I would bet every dollar in my pocket against every dollar in yours that the first question is, how long does this have to be? They're constantly looking to make a page count or to make a word count or to make a length. And what that does is it forces them to stretch content to meet the minimums, thereby giving them much too much room to operate and often cases much too much room to add stuff that doesn't give us uh, an additional benefit or as George would say doesn't add to the sum of human knowledge. Now there are some ways for us to fix that and in a lot of cases if you want to flip to the next slide the biggest thing we can do is to force them to prize value over temporal order. What we want to do is we want to get them to start thinking about what matters most instead of what happened first. The example that I'll give is one that I use in my own class. Um, I tend to hand out press releases from different organizations to have them try to work off of those in order to do some writing. And in a lot of cases, I'll pick fire press releases because fires are very easy to understand. You can see impact. You can understand how things occurred. But almost every single one of those students will mimic the press release that writes it in chronological order. So they almost always start off with the Boone County Fire Protection District arrived at 111 South Main Street after the report of a fire. You know, fire uh, department officials deployed hose truck 5 and ladder truck 12, and they kind of go into this whole thing. So if you're looking at that burning house, I say, um, I always ask them, I said, do you have a roommate? And they said, yeah, I do. I said, well, what happens when you get home after class and you say to your roommate, hey, what's going on? And the roommate says, oh, yeah, by the way, your mom called. There was a fire at your house. What's the first thing you want to know? And they always say, oh, is everybody okay? Right. And Well, how bad was the fire? Right. Well, what caused it? Right. Okay. So now imagine your roommate says, oh, well, see, the Boone County Fire Protection District responded to a fire call at 111 South Main Street. They deployed ladder truck five and, you know, pumper 12 or whatever it is. At, at what point do you just grab this kid by the shoulders and shake him and say, just tell me if everybody's okay? They start to understand that the value is what you want to focus on, not the chronological order of what occurs. And if you want to flip to the next slide, this plays into the same basic concept of kind of focusing on audience centricity. In most cases, when the students write, what they want to do is they want to tell you a story from what they want to say, as opposed to what you as the audience would want to hear or want to know. So pushing them to focus on audience centricity, the idea of what do I want to know as a reader is going to be a big deal. So I want to know, did my team win? Did our school get closed due to weather? Uh, is our campus being affected by these broader cuts? And if you think about it, that kind of audience centricity concept is extremely valuable for getting the message across to the readers. And if we can get the students to think that way, in terms of what would you want to know if you were reading this, they'll start to learn how to shift into more of that inverted pyramid format and more of that this matters because kind of approach, as opposed to simply focusing on, well, this happened first and this happened second and this happened third. You can flip to the next slide. Um, the third thing I, I say about that is, you want to help them to remove things that aren't helpful. You know, get rid of the stuff that doesn't need to be there. One of the biggest strengths I find for student writers is when they learn that they're not going to be perfect on the first pass. I try to explain to them that, uh, you know, nobody ever picks up a golf club, goes out to the first tee for the first swing, and hits a hole in one and says, well, I'm done now. Everything is about trying to you know, get a little better, trying to practice the, 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 the approach and so forth. So in most cases for them, the writing needs to be in the editing. And for a long time, they haven't had to do that. They've had to write, but they haven't really had to edit their own writing. So 
it doesn't hurt as much if they put too much in there. It's if they don't learn to kind of weed those things out. So getting them to look at each draft as kind of a process to kind of pick those pieces out that don't need to be there, that will help them sharpen the overall structure of the piece, eliminate the things that are going to bore the readers, and then get a really strong focus for the readership. Now, we can flip to the next slide. Um, the third thing I, I lovingly refer to is the I rule, I drool writing paradox. Uh, when I started working on the editing book, um, a friend of mine sent me this, this graphic, and I absolutely loved it because if anything ever described a writing process, this was it, which is to say, I got really excited. I'm thinking this is going to work. This is going to be great. And after a while, you have these weird kind of kind of mental swings of almost, I don't want to say bipolar, but it feels very kind of swing to the left, swing to the right on this, where at one moment you feel like I can conquer anything. I am, you know, the golden god. And in the other half, it's like, who on earth would ever want to see this? Why am I doing this? I'm nothing but an embarrassment. I noticed that happening in my students a lot um, because of the way that, again, the way they've been taught to this point, and we're kind of getting them at a, at a much later stage in their careers. So the students, in some cases, figure, I wrote it. It must be good, you know, the I rule part of this. And then those kids kind of get smacked around, and they start thinking, I wrote it, so it must be horrible. <laughs> Or they start off thinking, it must be horrible because I wrote it, and then you tell them it's okay, and then they're thinking, yes, I'm perfect. Well, there's somewhere in the middle is probably more true. Plus, for the longest time, they've been taught that there's a right answer. And as we all know in media writing, in journalism, in, in news, there is no right answer. So trying to help them to get past this is really where we go beyond the noun verb object and we go beyond the who versus whom and we really are more of writing coaches than anything else so if you want to kick to the next slide the first thing i tell people is that you want to help modulate their reality um i picked this slide because i i am bald and everyone said oh but going bald is sexy and i'm like eh, no i'm gonna look like dr evil with my head wearing a hula skirt which is mostly true so you got to modulate some reality for these students a little bit because you know better than anybody the difference between that sheer look of terror on their face because they're scared and they don't know anything or they feel they don't know anything versus the kids who are there thinking, I just want the right answer. Just give me an A and move me on with life. So you can also kind of tell the first kid who gets knocked around a little bit by the first time they've been told, you're not as good at this as you think you are. Um, or in my case, I had an instructor tell me once, uh, you're better than this, but you're going to actually have to do work for once in your life. And I thought that was kind of a, a, a really interesting way of putting it. So modulate their reality. Nobody is so bad at writing that literally they're gonna create a black hole in space from which nothing can escape. Conversely, nobody is so good at this that Hemingway himself is going to pop out of the grave and you know buy that kid a drink. So try to find a way to play to the middle of the fairway for some of these kids. And I think in a lot of cases, they're going to feel a lot stronger and more confident as you try to get them, you know, not thinking they're Channing Tatum, but they're not Dr. Evil either. So you can click to the next slide. Um, I love this um, because in most cases, they need to have life dictated to them in terms of better or worse. I, I always loved the Muppets, and I, I, I loved uh, this guy who played the piano. I'll never get it right. I'll never get it right. And he banged his head on the piano. I, I think some of us have seen students do this to keyboards. Here's the thing. I try to explain to them that a lead is not right or wrong, or a sentence isn't right or wrong, or a story isn't right or wrong. It's just better or worse than other options. There aren't really right answers. So there are some answers that will showcase a little bit of the better things, and there's some that are going to showcase a little bit of the worse things. So the biggest thing we can do for them is to have them look over whatever we're having them do, whether it's a, a one-sentence lead, a four-paragraph brief, or a complete piece and say, okay, 
let's look at the stuff that's really good. Let's look at what you did well, and let's put that on a pile over here. Now let's look at the stuff that is okay. It just might need a little bit of work and put that on another pile over here. And then let's put the stuff that needs to be set on fire over here and just you know, set it on fire and get rid of it. So we get rid of the stuff that really is a problem. We look at the stuff that's really kind of iffy and see how much of it we can patch up and you know kind of duct tape back together with them. And then we look at the stuff that's awesome and we say, there we go, let's make this happen. You can flip to the next slide if you'd like. Um, the last thing is that students have always felt that they should be good or bad. They're very, you know, kind of dichotomy driven. It's either right or it's wrong. It's good or it's bad. The, the light is on or it's off. They don't understand as much of the nuance and the gradation in terms of time spent versus outcome gathered helping them to see incremental progress is extremely important. One of the, the first journalism teachers I ever had did that for me. Uh, I had started to teach the class that he had taught to me, you know, four or five years earlier. And before I, I took the job, he said, I want to give you something. And he handed me a folder and I opened it. And there was the first thing I ever wrote for him. And Steve used to grade in green pen because he said that it was affirming. Well, he affirmed me like up one side and down the other. It looked like a shamrock patch had just gone to town on this thing. And I said, wow, I was horrible. He said, yeah, but you didn't get better right away. It was just a little bit at a time. Also, you were one of the better students, so this is what you're going to be dealing with. And trying to help the students see that incremental progress is going to be valuable. Um, I'm often reminded of my daughter Zoe when she was a little kid. Uh, we had a wall, I'm sure a lot of you have as well, or a door frame or whatever, where you used to mark their height. And Zoe would, you know, forget about it for six months until she walked into the laundry room and say, oh, can we measure my height? And so we'd put her up against the wall, we measure her height, and she'd have grown like two or three inches or whatever. So the next day, she'd come downstairs and say, Daddy, I feel taller. Can we do that again? Well, <laughs> you're not going to notice that little increment if she really is taller. But you noticed it over time. You noticed that massive amount of improvement. And the more that you show them the outcome for their work, the more they're going to see that incremental progress if they can kind of see how it developed over time. I guess the last thing I'll give you is what I call the four felicisms to help you help them without losing your mind. Um, I, I like these because I think that they're going to be helpful to us as educators, and I, I find them to be true um, even if we don't like them. Uh, in some cases. The first one is uh, learn how to carry sand in a sieve. I've always loved that imagery from Fahrenheit 451 where Montag is trying to make sense of his memories and it keeps seeming like it's sliding out through that sieve. Um, when it comes to helping students get better at writing, I am sure we all feel like we're trying to catch sand in the sieve as we're marking points off for fact or errors or points for punctuation or grammar or style or structure or whatever else we do. And really what the students see at that point is nothing but failure. Now, to be fair, you can carry sand in a sieve from point A to point B if you focus on a couple of things. Uh, first of all, the more you dawdle, the, the more you lose. So in a lot of cases, I think, I know that I had started to do this a little bit and then I started thinking about it. I started digging in on every comma or every split infinitive and things like that. And I was losing more kids than I was gaining. Now, I'm not saying those things don't matter, but to what degree they matter based on it was really based on what level of students I was teaching and how much I needed them to pick up other things. So I tended to do what I called saving the chunks. You can carry the big chunks of sand that don't slide through those, those little sieve grates if you say, what's the most valuable thing I want? So for me, instead of griping about one comma being out of place or whatever, I waited until I could show how 10 of them are out of place and how they're destructive to a sentence or how um, something else could be shown in a pattern that I could easily correct instead of saying that comma is wrong. Because a lot of times the students will just kind of feel like, again, that guy with the piano, he's never going to get it right. The other thing that is important is to explain why. Um, People will think you're crazy if you start trying to transport sand in a sieve, but if you explain why you're doing it, they might understand you. And it's the same thing that's true with students who read over their corrected work. 
if they don't know why something's wrong, they're never going to learn how to fix it. And so I try to find a way to explain why something works or why something doesn't. And that's when I get students with a little bit stronger buy-in. You can go to the next one. Um, I love this phrase, is this the hill you're willing to die on? My friend Allison and I used to talk about this a lot uh, in student media when we've been working in it like the past 20 odd years. Uh, I, I really mean it is 20 years and they were quite odd. But in any case, what we would do is we would look at a situation with a, with a staff. You know, students wanted to change the flag for the third time that semester or uh, they decided that they were going to use verb noun attributions just to be edgy or they decided to make the whole paper green because, well, why? We don't know. They just decided it. And each time we'd look at each other and we'd kind of discuss it a little bit. And finally, one of us would say to the other, OK, is this really the hill we want to die on today? And usually the answer was no. So we would kind of let certain things go. But then there were times where we're like, yeah, this is really important. So basically the point of that is that we as educators need to figure out what's the most important thing we want to emphasize. Uh, if I've learned anything with working with students, it's that the human brain will not suck in nearly enough uh, information based on how much we're pouring out there. I used to love that little far side cartoon of a guy with a shrunken head in a classroom and he would say, may I be excused, my brain is full. And I, I, I know that a lot of students tend to feel that way. So I try to focus in on that. And that's also what I try to do in all the books that I started writing for Sage, I tended to have, instead of a, a random conclusion, I would always have the, the big three saying, look, if your brain is full, just take these three things with you and, and you won't lose out on pretty much anything. So for me, they end, the, 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 the hills I want to die on, or the hills I'm willing to die on, rather, are things like fact errors, single sentence paragraphs, proper attributions for paraphrases and quotes. You probably have your own particular kind of isms as they are, but if you can get that list down to a few key hills that you're willing to die on, so to speak, it probably will make for a much stronger buy-in from your students and a much stronger learning experience. You can flip to the next one. Um, this one I, I've been carrying with me since high school, which is quite some time, which is to say everyone makes mistakes. It's the stupid ones you got to avoid making twice. Um, the guy who gave me that was actually my high school valedictorian uh, during his valedictorian address. The guy's name was Willie Nelson. Uh, no kidding. He, he didn't go by Bill or Will. It was always Willie. Uh, so Willie Nelson was explaining that when he was about eight years old, his sister was being a pest while he was trying to play baseball in the backyard. So finally he couldn't deal with it anymore. He reached back and he poked her in the face with a baseball bat. Um, he got sent to his room room and they were contemplating his punishment when his grandfather came in and he said to him, he said, boy, I hope you learned a valuable lesson today. Everyone makes mistakes. It's the stupid ones you got to avoid making twice. And the reason why I like this is because students are always freaking out about failure. They don't know what to do because they always think that every single error is going to cost them everything and they're never going to get an A or they're never going to pass and they're going to end up working the night shift at hard for the rest of their lives, you know, praying that they get promoted to the shake machine. You know, I always want to say to them, and I often do, guess what, kid, you're going to screw up. It's going to happen. The trick really is that you have to figure out what happened with that failure and how you can learn from it. And what's funny is the students do this all the time without really thinking about it. You know, the, the students who, you know, they, they go out there and they use those cheesy pickup lines at the bar and get shot down. They learn not to use those anymore. Uh, the kids who go home and play video games constantly, they learn how to advance on a level, you know, after they die six or eight times, try to get past it in a certain way. Uh, students who play instruments, I often tell them this. I, I say, how many of you have played an instrument? And most of them will raise their hand. And I'll say, were you perfect at it right away? And one kid said, uh, no, it sounded like I was trying to murder an ostrich. Uh, and ever since then, I can't listen to the clarinet the same way when I think about that. But the point is that I always tell them, look, you're going to screw up. And I know personally I've learned more by screwing things up than I ever learned by doing it right the first time. They should have a healthy respect for failure, but they should also understand that if you can't avoid it, you need to learn something from it. And whatever you take away from it is probably going to be much more valuable than anything else. Uh, you can kick to the last slide here. Uh, journalism is never done, it's just due. 
uh, this came from uh, my first journalism teacher. He used to say this to me whenever I was stressing out over a deadline. Every story I wrote, everything I did always seemed to need one more source or one more quote or one more edit. And I'd be sitting there at the end, I'd be the only person left in the lab and I'm trying to move three paragraphs into different spaces and stuff. And finally, Steve just would tell me, look, it's never gonna be done, it's just due. And so I learned to kind of take that concept and tell the students, it's not gonna be perfect. Get it close. Avoid the disasters that can be lurking in there. Um, and really that got me where I needed to be because I started out on a night desk as a, as, a, uh, as a professional reporter at the State Journal. I became a much better night desker. I became a much better cops editor and a much better writer overall by learning how to get it close and focusing on the things that matter. And, you know, I kind of tell the students, you know, you know, finish it up, call it a day and, and move on to the next task at hand. And with that in mind, I'm going to finish up, call it a day and move on to the next task at hand. So uh, uh, I'll turn this back on over to Michael. And thanks so much for sticking with us over the uh, technical difficulties there. Yeah, that was, Vince, that was, that was great. I, I just want to say that. I want to say thank you very much. Uh, we're going to go to questions from pe people in just a moment. But as I mentioned earlier, Vince has written a number of dynamic books for Sage with the latest Dynamics of Media Editing coming out early next year. And we wanted to encourage any teachers or professors in the audience interested in examining one of these books with an eye to using them as a textbook to click on the red Request Review Copy button on any of the book's web pages at sagepub.com. And um, uh, I also wanted to remind you about uh, Vince's blog, dynamicswriting.com, and you can see the URL down at the bottom of this page. So now we are going to spend some time addressing some of the questions from uh, both myself and from uh, and from the audience. And um, I'm, I'm the moderator, so I, I get to ask the first couple. But for those that are out there wanting to ask some questions, please continue to send them in using the question box on the right side of your screen or on Twitter using hashtag SageTalks. And if we can't get to your question by the end of the hour, Vince has agreed to address them in a follow-up blog post that will appear on Sage's social science space. So Vince, we, we just showed the books, and I, I wanted to give you a chance for just a, a moment of um, shameless self-promotion. Your presentation <laughs> was really good, so why should I buy your book? Why, what, what do your books have that I didn't already learn just now? Well, I, I don't tell people to buy my books because I tend to find that people will immediately do the exact opposite of whatever they're told. And uh, if anybody out there doesn't believe me, uh, I want you to, whatever you do right now, do not think of a pink elephant. So yeah, I, I, I kind of have fun with that as you're all cursing at me. Um, honestly, the, the reason why I, I started working on these books was because I wanted to give the students everything they could possibly need and instructors everything they could possibly need um, in any way that I thought was going to be relevant, useful, and interesting. I tended to not like textbooks when I was a student because I felt like I was being belittled uh, as, a, as a reader. It was the sage on the stage, if you'll pardon me borrowing that, that terminology, um, and saying, you know, I am the golden god, I am so good at this, and you are so lucky that you are fortunate enough to read my wisdom. I, I don't think anybody learns from that. My approach is very simple. We're in this together, uh, th myself and the reader, or myself and, and you all and the reader. Um, we're all in this together to make somebody get a little bit closer to being as good at, at writing as they want to be. Um, I liked refocusing the different books in different ways. The media writing book I wrote specifically for my class of uh, writing for the media because I had all these PR students and ad students and integrated web management students and they needed to know all the stuff that I was telling them but every book had news writing and reporting on the cover and they would just look at me and say I'm going into PR I don't need that stuff and of course as instructors, you know, we're like the guy with the piano. We keep banging our head down thinking, you do need to know this stuff. It's just they didn't they didn't see it until it was much too late. So I, I tried to make that a little bit more inclusive. And that's also the approach I, I took in the editing book, because everybody needs editing. And if you don't believe so, I'm I'm sure there are plenty of examples out there of 
ads and press releases and marketing material that have gone south, including the uh, the tickets for the president's first State of the Union address, where they had to reprint all the tickets because they misspelled union. But I, I like the idea that I'm going to give you everything that I can possibly give you. I'm with you. I'm not just a name on the side, on the spine of a book. And so uh, if, if there's anything I can do to make your life easier, I'm going to do it. So uh, hopefully the book does it. But if it doesn't, I've got the blog. If the blog doesn't do it, you have my email address. If the email doesn't do it, um, you know, pick up a phone and yell at me, I guess. <laughs> So we've got a question from Lauren about uh, what you do, what you do when you are in class, and it's like, do you spend time before getting into the uh, skill development to have a discussion about the problems that you just listed in the in the presentation? Kind of, do you have kind of a meta conversation before you get into the micro? In some cases, it will depend on on the students themselves. Um, sometimes I get a class and it's just like everything else you kind of you kind of see what kind of hand you've been dealt before you decide how to play it but most of the time I'll lay out kind of the concerns that I've mentioned in the uh, in the presentation but I try to find a way and that's why even even this is a little difficult for me um, because I'm looking at a screen usually I'm used to looking at faces and so I can see where they're lost and where they're not and that's where I'll pick out like the example of the burning house or you know a car wreck or something like that to say what would you want to know most um, but I do lay out as much of that as I possibly can before uh, we get into this and then I repeat it when it becomes salient so when the student notices something that that's exactly where we talk about it um, another example of that would be I talk about the different types of leads that are problematic and I call it the held a meeting lead where, you know, the Board of Regents held a meeting to talk about whether to raise tuition or not. And it's like, what do you want to know? Well, I want to know if they raise tuition. Okay, so that should be your lead. So then when they write a lead that's a held a meeting or gave a speech lead, I say, remember how you'd want to know if tuition went up? And they're like, oh, yeah, I remember that. It's like, yeah, that's kind of where we, we fell off the, the, the horse there a little bit and then they learn how to get back on it. So here's the question that I think is actually kind of a, a much bigger question than the question initially suggests, but it's like, how do you teach students to fully own the material, to grasp the dramatic story in an event, but to avoid making assumptions in doing so? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, what I try to do is I try to tell them that, that they need to show me something and show it to me in a way that's going to make me care about it. And one of the, the, the cheap philokisms that I use is, if you wouldn't read it, don't write it. And I think in a lot of cases, the students will, again, take on a different persona as writers instead of thinking about it from the perspective of their audience. So what I do is I try to place them in the position of what their audience is, and then I try to get them to think about it in a way that they can then communicate more effectively to that audience. So in many cases, just trying to get them to nail down the core value of what exactly is it that you think I should know um, is, is really crucial. And in some cases, it can be very easily done in that noun verb ob object kind of approach. So that's kind of how I approach it. And I'm not sure if that answers the question or not, but if, I, if it doesn't, go ahead and fire it at me again and I'll, I'll see what I can do. Well, I'm kind of interested in that that assumption part because it, it seems like a lot of people bring a lot of assumptions to things these days in, in this uh, era of fake news, et cetera. And I'm just wondering, just if, if we just focus on the very bottom part of that question, how do we avoid? How do we teach people to avoid making assumptions? I I go back to what I learned when we were on the playground as like ten year olds when somebody's bragging about something or saying something or other to be true, and we never called it fake news. We just said says who. That's where a lot of journalism, I think, has value in terms of making sure that you can source your material, making sure that you're using attributions properly, and making sure that you're using um, attributed material clearly and often enough so that your readers can then weigh out for themselves to what degree they believe it or not. Uh, and I think that is where we tend to try to take away some of their assumptions. So, uh, for example, I had a, a, a lead that a student was rewriting, and they referred to somebody as a potentially dangerous man. And I said, where do you get that from? 
well, he's done X, Y, and Z. And I said, okay, just tell me he's done X, Y, and Z. And I, I as a reader, will look at him and say, he's potentially dangerous. Or I'll look at him and go, he's just a weirdo. But I get to make that decision. So I try to, again, put them in the position of the audience and saying, how would you like it if I referred to you as whatever it is or told you that you needed to think about something in a particular way? Uh, believe me, as a, as a Cleveland Browns fan, uh, the assumption that we're going to lose constantly is, is one of those assumptions I constantly keep pushing up against. Uh, so the trick, I think, in my mind is to, to make sure that they understand that there's always a better way to do it by simply laying out reality for me and then letting me do the, you know, letting me do the work on my end as a reader, a consumer, and a knowledgeable uh, member of the audience. So, Vince, when you and I went to study journalism, it was always with the understanding that we'd work at a newspaper and there would be a copy desk, and then from the copy desk stuff, would the, the con you, you'd write it, and then you'd have your editor, and then that would go to the copy desk, and it would go back to city desk, and about a thousand people were going to look at it before it went into print. And in today's kind of web world, I'll write something, I'll write my own headline, and I'll, I'll slap it up, and it's like nobody gets to see it. So I'm wondering, how do you teach students to be the whole enterprise in one fell swoop these days? Well, I show them what happens when people fail by not paying enough attention. Um, the example that I posted on the blog uh, just the other day was the one about the, um, the Supreme Court hearing and the, uh, the issue regarding uh, the recent allegations being levied against uh, Brett Kavanaugh. Somebody had written an article uh, uh, quoting nothing but ratemyprofessor.com about Christine Ford, and they wrote how, according to her, uh, her ratings up on Rate My Professor, she was mean to students, she was probably mentally unstable. I think the headline was something, there's something wrong with her. Well, the problem was that they picked the wrong Christine Ford. It wasn't this, it, it wasn't the, the woman accusing uh, Kavanaugh at all. Uh, they had the wrong woman, they had the wrong university, they had, they had the wrong everything. And that failure went viral so fast that you can't ever get it back. So uh, again, another kind of felocism I throw at the students, I said, you're playing with live ammo, um, and there's no getting it back once you pull the trigger, so you better be sure before you go. I like to make them understand that paranoia is their best friend. The more worried they are going in that this could get out there and and really do some damage. Uh, that's how I get them to work on their editing more. That's how I get them to work on on their fact checking more. That's how I get them to press a little harder to be absolutely certain before they publish. Um, one story I'll just give you very briefly is we had a situation out here a few years back where uh, a young man who was a, a, a he had returned from overseas uh, in the uh, in the war. Uh, he'd come back. He was engaged, and he was a student at UW Oshkosh. And something happened where he just snapped, and he went out into the park and shot up a family, and and ended up shooting at police. Well, it turned out that his fiance was also a UWO student, and every news outlet was trying to get this young woman to speak to them. Well, my student sent her an email on the university email system saying, "If you'd like to talk, uh, I'll listen." and the young lady called my reporter back. And she couldn't record it. She was working on notes and typing very quickly. And every time, you know, she was doing the best she could, but she was looking like she was panicking. When she finally got done with about a 10 minute phone call, she wrote her story and she said, I need you to sit with me and read this. And everything I looked at, I said, are you sure about this? Can you prove this? Are you absolutely positive she said that? And finally, Katie looked at me and she says, what is wrong with you? You're scaring the hell out of me. I said, you don't know what's going to happen the minute you post this to the web. And sure enough, the minute she posted it, our web traffic went through the roof. We had journalists from all over the state calling us saying, how do you know this is true? Where are you getting this from? And the police argued that the young lady had broken off the engagement, and that's what sent him over the edge. And the young lady said she hadn't done that. So we had information that was contradicting the police. And although the police were not happy with us, they could not refute it. 
And the journalists that were out there at the major papers around the state had to quote our paper because nobody else could get that information. And Katie finally, after all of this died down, she looked at me and she says, I get it now. I finally understand what you mean about playing with live ammo. That was scary. So I think in some cases you, you convey it with that concept of you're playing with live ammo, but in other cases it's you almost have to live it. And that's what I always meant by, you know, you learn by your mistakes or you learn by your experiences. So I've got a, a kind of a pair of questions here based on two different assumptions. One is that students are consumers okay. of news and one is that they're not. So let's do it. Let's assume they are consumers of news. How do you handle students who fall back on real or imagined journalese? You know, like newsflash, a kid got hurt, or writing a kind of headline that's missing a noun or verb instead of a first sentence. So that's the first question. We'll go to, I'll have a follow-up on kids that don't read news. Well, the, the first thing I do, that, that happens a lot, um, and I, I try to say to them, is this something you would normally say? We always end up where uh, someone, was, uh, someone sustained injuries and was transported to a nearby medical facility, and I said, anybody ever get hurt in here? And some kid will raise his hand and say, what happened? He goes, oh, I broke my leg playing football. You know, they, they had to get the stretcher out. You know, they carted me out the field. It ended my high school career. And I said, so when you got hurt, what happened? He goes, oh, they took me to the hospital. I said, right, they took you to the hospital. Did you kind of lay there and go, oh, no, I have sustained an injury. Please, someone transport me to a nearby medical facility so that I may sustain medical attention. No, you know, it, it sounds ridiculous when they hear it spoken back to them. And so in a lot of cases, it's that idea of holding up that mirror to them and showing them, this is really what you look like when you're doing this. Um, and that's kind of one of the, the better ways to be able to do that. So what, what's the second question? So that assumes that the, the student has read this stuff and, and you know, they're, they're parroting something they've heard. How do I get students to read news on a regular basis in the first place? I think in a lot of cases, they consume information far more than previous generations. The difference is, is that there's no real, um, there's no real sense of collectivism anymore in terms of what matters. And part of that's on the journalists today, I think, in a lot of ways. They're saying, well, kids should read more news. Well, why? What are you telling them that matters to them? How are you showing them this matters because? And it goes back to another example I, I tend to use, which is our university foundation uh, got into some serious trouble by overextending itself financially. And the chancellor at the time had issued comfort letters, which it was not what he was not supposed to do. Apparently, they're still arguing about that in court. But what ended up happening was uh, the, the, the foundation was going to declare bankruptcy. And I said to the students in my reporting class, I said, have you guys been following this, this foundation thing? And they all looked at me and said, no, why would we ever pay attention? That's like, what? Who cares? And I said, how many of you are on scholarship? You know, maybe you have a scholarship. And they, like, they all raised their hand. I said, where do you think your scholarship money is? And they all got this look of realization like, oh, my God, the place that holds on to my scholarship money might be going bankrupt. And the minute that I gave them a break, they're all on the computer reading everything they possibly can about it. But nobody ever said that in an article to them in a way that it made it relevant, useful, or interesting to them. So I think part of the issue is, you know, what they're reading is relevant, useful, or interesting to them. And the question becomes, what should they be reading? You know, What's the, what, what's the Brussels sprouts of, of information that's out there that we think is important that they should be eating? And how is it that journalists can do a little bit better job of making it more palatable to them? So do you think citizen journalists are a threat to journalism as a profession? And then do you have any suggestions on how to help students understand that? And this is the, the questioner who says, understanding the real journalism is about telling stories with facts, not with personal opinions, judgments, or assumptions. Yeah, that's one of the hardest things that I run into. It's it's not just citizen journalism. It's also sports journalism where everybody wants to be the next Bill Simmons and just ramble about their favorite team. Um, I think the biggest thing is I ask them, why does your opinion matter more than anybody else? And also, who is it that is paying attention to your opinion? So think from the perspective of the audience. What why would the audience pay attention to you of all people? Um, they'll, I'll ha if they write a story that says something about 
um, you know, how, you know, the Packers are the greatest team on earth or whatever. I'm like, again, says who? And well, says me, I'm like, okay, the Packers aren't the greatest team on earth. Prove me wrong. And so then they start digging in and they're like, well, Aaron Rodgers has thrown for this many touchdowns and this many passes and blah, blah. I said, now you're getting into the facts. All you have to do is show me the facts and I'm probably going to be mentally in agreement with you. So don't tell me something, show me something. That's where I think a lot of the writing uh, that's out there now fails because people just assume they're right. And if you scream it loud enough, people will come around to you. So your tips in, in today's seminar were about, or today's webinar were about writing. But I'm going to ask a real quick question about reporting, and it's just a personal concern of mine, that it seems one person reports something anymore and 60 other news outlets then opine on what that one person reported. And I'm just wondering, how do we get students to understand that reporting involves shoe leather and, and telephones and emails and things like that, and not just reading other people's coverage? Well, the I, I think there are a number of, of concerns there. One is what happens when everybody is holding on to a single strand of rope and you're not 100% sure how strong that rope is or how well anchored it is. Um, I, there are so many examples out there of people who um, somebody puts up a prank something or other, somebody reports it, somebody reports on that something. Uh, those of us who are a little older remember when you used to have the dual deck cassette tapes and, you know, your buddy bought a, you know, a copy of Bon Jovi or something and, you know, you, you dubbed it off your buddy and then somebody dubbed it off of you and then somebody dumped it off of them. And all of a sudden all you hear is hissing and like the little twinkles in the background of living on a prayer. You don't really get actual sound. You just get noise. And, I, I think in a lot of ways that if we can show them examples of this is what happens when everybody just buys into that one thing. Uh, the Christine Ford situation is a perfect example of that because so many people were simply citing this one source and it wasn't true. Uh, when Gabrielle Giffords was shot, there was a similar thing where one source reported that she had died and everybody just kind of did the, you know, according to this source, that was true. Um, you know, I also kind of look at the idea of why do you want to talk about what other people are talking about? Instead, you know, why not set the agenda for the discussion by going out and doing actual journalism? And not everything that matters to source A is going to matter to source B when it comes to news. So I think the biggest thing is to try to find a way to reach your audience in a way that's going to matter the most to them. And if you can focus on that, you're going to have a much, much stronger overall uh, uh, approach to this, and I think you're going to have a much, much more satisfying career. So I think we've, we're down to what's probably going to be the last uh, uh, question for our recorded part of the webinar, um, and it's kind of a, it's a, a kind of a tactical question, and it's a, it, a, I tell students, this it came in, uh, the questioner says, I tell students they've been news writers all their lives because they tell each other what has happened around campus, they get to it. It's kind of reminiscent of your uh, to the fire and the roommate thing. They mm -hmm. use the five W's and an H, and it's a matter of getting them to write that way because they're already telling it that way. And is that too much of a leap? No, not at all. As a matter of fact, uh, the first thing I do when we sit down for uh, the writing for the media class is I ask them, where do you get information from? I don't use the word news because the minute you say news, they think, you know, it has to be, you know, on a broadcast TV screen with a guy with a tie and a shirt and a coat, you know, and an official voice or, you know, printed in the New York Times above the fold. I say, where do you get stuff from? Where do you hear about stuff? And they just tell me, you know, Facebook, Twitter, um, you know, Instagram. And I ask them, you know, who do you follow? Why do you follow them? And it's like, because it's interesting and I need to know this stuff. And, and it kind of goes from there. So students have been storytellers their whole lives. They just just don't see it that way. And I think that's an exactly perfect way to, to put it because not only does it minimize their, their overall fear of, oh my God, how am I going to be good at this, to really kind of push themselves to say, I do this all the time. I'm just doing it in a different way. Um, and it just feels a little funnier when you're doing it this way. That's all. So that's a, that's a great example. That's not too big of a leap. And I would really strongly encourage anybody to use that kind of approach. Yeah, I can remember being a city desk report, uh, editor and having people come back and tell me what the story was going to be and then proceed not to write that. So I, I, I for what it matters, it's just like I, I think it, I don't think it's too much of a leap either. Great. 
It's but nice I to do, be right occasionally on my end. <laughs> oh, good. So if you're looking for my endorsement, it's just like you, you've got to be better than that. Also. But um, I think this is about what we've got time for today. And I want to thank um, all our audience for joining us. And I want to give a special thanks to our speaker, Vince Filak of the University of Wisconsin at Oshkosh. And if you like this, don't forget his books on writing, which are published by Sage, and his Dynamics of Writing blog. Um, and he, uh, Vince referenced that a couple of times. And having read some of the posts, I, I think it's well worth reading. In the coming weeks, I want you to be on the lookout for an email that includes a link to the entire webinar and slides that we've had today and um, uh, any answers to questions that we didn't have time to get to. And I'd like you to stay connected uh, with uh, us on our blog, Social Science Space, for information about upcoming webinars. And again, I, I, I want to thank you all for being here, and good day.